the difference between the United States and China in in this West Asian, let's say, context is that the Chinese have not been pursuing leadership. They have not been interfering in the internal affairs of different countries. So when China offered to mediate, just like the Iraqis, the Iraqis, they didn't try to, uh, I mean, they, of course, it, the Iraqi government is not a strong government, sadly, and hopefully in the years to come, things will get better. But the Iraqis never try to impose their will or manipulate the situation. And the Chinese didn't either. And that's why the talks were successful. The Americans, though, on the other hand, they always assume leadership and they manipulate, they cheat. They're, they're no honest broker. Hello, everyone. I'm Rania Kalik, and this is Dispatches. The Middle East has had a tumultuous couple of decades. That only got worse after the Saudis severed diplomatic ties with Iran back in 2016, which makes the historic deal brokered by China for a Saudi-Iran rapprochement so groundbreaking. So far, this has led to a potential peace deal in Yemen and whispers of a coming detente between Saudi Arabia and Syria following the failed regime change war against Assad, in which Saudi was a main player. This reflects not only a changing region, but a shifting world order. While the U.S. focuses on its proxy war in Ukraine, with U.S. officials expressing frustration with peace both there and in the Middle East like a toddler throwing a temper tantrum, its adversary China looks like the adult in the room, prioritizing diplomacy and acting as a force for stability. What does this mean for U.S. aspirations in the Middle East? How about around the globe? And what might be the consequences of China's diplomatic leadership on Middle East stability? To better understand what's going on and what we can expect, I'm joined by Mohammed Morandi, professor of English literature and Orientalism at the University of Tehran. But before we jump into it, this is just the first half of this episode with Professor Morandi. The second half is available for Breakthrough News members only. You can become a member at patreon.com slash Breakthrough News. And as always, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the bell so you get a notification whenever we post new content. And if you appreciate this show, you can also donate below on YouTube. Professor Morandi, welcome back to the show. Thank you very much for having me. So big things are happening in the Middle East. I think um, in the last just couple of months, it's almost like you know, I don't want to overemphasize it, but it does feel like we're living in a bit of a new world. Uh, and that's, of course, with the Saudi-Iran deal. I mean, this is a really, really big deal. It's been making headlines. Before we get into some more specifics, I just kind of want to hear your general thoughts. Um, why does this detente between Saudi Arabia and Iran matter? Uh, and how does this going to change what's taking place across the region? Well, we have to go back a bit and remember that when... General Soleimani was going to Iraq. He was going to visit the former Iraqi prime minister, uh, Mr. Dr. Adel Abdul Mahdi. Uh, the prime minister at that time, he had received a letter from the Saudis about discussing or trying to find ways to de-escalate de and eventually move towards some sort of uh, accommodation and some uh, towards rapprochement. And uh, obviously the Americans did not want that to happen. Uh, the Americans have people everywhere in Iraq. They occupied the country for two decades. So uh, they, they murdered him to block that rapprochement. And uh, later on, the Iraqi government continued to support the notion of dialogue between Iran and Saudi Arabia. So they began, Iran and Saudi Arabia accepted Iraqi mediation. Uh, Iran gave that role to the Iraqis out of friendship because they wanted to raise the stature of the Iraqi government and to make it stronger, especially since US forces were still in the country. Uh, to help build the self-confidence of the of the government and the state. 
discussions began. It was done through the Supreme National Security Council in Iran and the equivalent in Saudi Arabia. The deputy head of the Supreme National Security Council would carry out the negotiations. Most were done in Iraq. But there was a there were sticking points, including the fact that the Saudis wanted Iran to give up their support for Ansarullah, the Houthis, as they're often called in the West, and uh, basically to negotiate on their behalf, mm -hmm. which Iran wouldn't do and couldn't do. And so that was a sticking point. That was a key sticking point. Later on, when the Chinese president went to Saudi Arabia, the issue of mediation was discussed with Saudi leaders. And before President Raisi's trip to China, his state visit, the Chinese government passed on a request to Iran, or they made a request to Iran to see if Iran would accept mediation. And during uh, the two presidents' talks in Beijing, uh, the Iranians agreed. And then we had the negotiations in Beijing. The Saudis ultimately put aside that particular uh, demand or request uh, with regards to Yemen. And uh, so things began to change and evolve. This is very important, obviously, because Saudi Arabia is an important country in the region. It uh, is also... Uh, very influential in other countries in the Persian Gulf, the smaller countries. It's influential in uh, the decision-making process in the United Arab Emirates, in Kuwait, and in Bahrain, definitely. So, um, and it has influence elsewhere. So, uh, for Iran, better relations with Saudi Arabia means better relations with some of these countries. But I think more importantly, I mean, far more important is the fact that this created a momentum. And that momentum led the Saudis to finally negotiate with the, the government in Sana'a in Yemen. And uh, we seem to be moving towards a peace deal. Mm -hmm. And also the Saudis are changing their policy towards Syria and normalizing their relationship. And they've been They've invited President Assad to the Arab League summit, which is very good news. Mm -hmm. This creates a whole new, I think, situation across West Asia and uh, countries in the region which have been divided, uh, largely thanks to the United States. The, the United States and the Israelis help create divisions and strengthen those divisions so that it can maintain its presence and control. So since those divisions are collapsing, that creates great opportunities for the economies of these different countries, for interaction, political interaction between politicians and governments, and also uh, the, the fact that people can travel back and forth so that normalization, I think, is a huge plus for the region and very bad news for the Americans and its key allies. Also, we have the talks between Iran, Russia, Turkey, and Syria. If that comes to a successful conclusion, then that will really help change things further. And that would be, I think, the straw that breaks the camel's back for the United States in West Asia. I mean, yeah, this is, I, I mean, I can't emphasize how important this is on both the regional level and in many ways, a global level. I want to talk for a moment about the U.S. reaction. I, I also do want to ultimately get into some more specifics about the nature of what might take place between, you know, reintegrating Syria into the region, which seems likely to take place, as well as what you just mentioned about Turkey, um, Turkey, Iran, Syria, Russia. Uh, but first, the U.S. reaction is so interesting because, you know, it's clear that the Western political class 
sees really any Chinese diplomatic leadership in the region in like the most negative way imaginable. Um, and anything, of course, involving a de-escalation with Iran as something that's completely horrible and should be opposed um, at every level. I just want to read from from a an article in Foreign Policy uh, about this deal. Uh, just an excerpt from it. It says, for Iranian, for the Iranian Supreme Leader and for the IRGC, the deal, meaning the deal between the Saudis and the Iranians, is about far more than normalizing ties with the Saudi government in Riyadh. Instead, it is about further facilitating, along with China and Russia, the rise of a new anti-Western global order and excluding the U.S. from a new regional arrangement. I just I wanted to read that because it expresses so many anxieties about and, it, and that, that's one of so many articles that that say the same thing along those same lines. And then also we saw that in recent days, I think it was just last week, um, the head, the U.S. spy chief, like basically visited Riyadh and expressed displeasure over the ongoing Saudi rapprochement with both Tehran and Damascus. This is a what is it? William Burns is that his first name? Williams. This is or Bill Burns as they call him. Expressed frustration with the Saudis, according to people familiar with the matter. Matter he told Saudi Crown Prince. Mohammed bin Salman, that the U.S. has felt blindsided by Riyadh's rapprochement with Iran and Syria. Uh, I just I want to know from your perspective as somebody who lives inside Iran, as somebody who's been involved in, in varying capacities with trying to, even though you, you didn't necessarily always agree with it, with trying to um, resurrect the Iranian uh, nuclear deal, the, the JCPOA, which, of course, the U.S. tore up and never went back to. Um, so you have a very insider view of all this. How is the absence of the U.S. in any diplomacy whatsoever, and then as well as the very frustrated reaction with the idea of peace, how is that being discussed in Iran, interpreted in Iran? And what do you think that means about American power in the region? Well, a couple of things first. One is that I was never opposed to the nuclear deal. I was skeptical because I... My apologies. That the United States would never abide by its commitments. I said that in on day one when the deal was signed, and I was there in Vienna. Uh, I felt that we needed to have um, elements within the deal included within the deal to make sure the Americans abide by their commitments. And so the negotiations that took place last year were basically negotiations to protect the JCPOA when re-implemented so that the Americans couldn't cheat. Because the Americans, they use loopholes and they use ambiguities in the text to, to undermine uh, the deal. And also if there if there's no sequencing or if there's if there are no um, elements within the deal to make sure that the Americans abide by their commitments and it's just based on trust, the Americans are not going to do it. That's that's what we learned in 2015, which I think even though it hurt Iran immensely, the fact that Iran implemented the nuclear deal and the Americans didn't, in a way it was good for Iran because it showed to Iranians and the international community, at least outside of the West, where the problem really lies, that it was never really Iran that was the problem and that it was the United States and its allies. Right. The difference between the United States and China in, in this West Asian, let's say, context, is that the Chinese have not been pursuing leadership. They have not been interfering in the internal affairs of different countries. So when China offered to mediate, just like the Iraqis, the Iraqis, they didn't try to, uh, I mean, they, of course, it, the Iraqi government is not a strong government, sadly, and hopefully in the years to come, things will get better. But the Iraqis never try to impose their will or manipulate the situation. And the Chinese didn't either. And that's why the talks were successful. The Americans, though, on the other hand, they always assume leadership and they manipulate, they cheat. They're, they're no honest broker. We saw that in the negotiations, let's say, over Palestine, mm -hmm. over the, the, between the Israeli regime and the, the Palestinians, so that the Americans never intended to be fair or to give the Palestinian people uh, anything that even smells of justice. Right. So 
the United States, I mean, even uh, right now, the Iraqis, uh, they have huge problems spending their own oil wealth because of the United States. The United States, they have uh, a lot of veto power in Iraq. So the Americans have never shown goodwill and they've never been an honest broker. And that's why they're so despised. And now that the United States is weakening, and I'll get to that in a second, uh, that's why countries like Saudi Arabia are tilting away from the United States. The Saudis, they they look and see how the United States treats its allies. Uh, in Afghanistan, the United States just pulled the plug and it's their allies in Afghanistan for two decades were uh, you know, everything, everything they had suddenly collapsed. Mm -hmm. uh, they weren't even informed beforehand. They were told that, you know, that the Americans would stand firm or stand with them. And even during the talks between Iran and Saudi Arabia in Beijing, the Americans and the Europeans were undermining the government in Georgia, which was interesting because Georgia is very friendly to the West. The Georgian government is very friendly to the EU and the United States. Yet, since the Georgian parliament wanted to pass a law that strengthened its sovereignty, that control, or, or at least when people would fund NGOs in the country or the media in the country, uh, it would be seen by everyone. Everyone would know who's getting what from where since they wanted to pass to pass a law uh to make clear things clear for the public and 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 the, the government where where the money is coming from and who's receiving the money the money the united states and the europeans became outraged and they supported the opposition and they threatened the government with sanctions so they like threatened their, their, own. their playbook is so predictable, huh? Yes, exactly. So they they used color revolution tactics, and the, the government in Georgia was forced to back down. Well, Saudi Arabia looks at these things and says to itself, "The United States is declining. The Europeans are very weak. We can't trust them either, even as they decline. Biden doesn't have good relations with the Saudis." So we have to, as they would say in the West, they'd have they'd have to hedge their bets. They'd have to sort of open up, build up relations with Iran, build up re relations with China, with Russia and others, so that all their eggs are in, in the American basket. And the Iranians welcome that. When uh, the Iranians have been calling on for the relations between Iran and Saudi Arabia to be restored for a very long time now, and so then it was the Saudis who were initially uh, uninterested. And then later on, they put in preconditions. And but finally, we've reached where we are now. Mm -hmm. But I think it's all it's clear for everyone here that the United States is on the decline. The very fact that this deal was done, the very fact that uh, the Russians, the Iranians, the Turks and the Syrians are talking all of these are signs, among other signs, the, the Russians and the Chinese speaking with each other, the Brazilian president going to China, all these different uh, events that are taking place simultaneously. Uh, countries negotiating using their own currencies with one another, um, Assan doing the same, the Indonesian president uh, speaking about the need to move away from dependence on the U.S. currency. I think all of these together are make it evident that the United States in decline, is in decline, and there are a host of reasons for it, but I think one of the, the most important right now is the war in Ukraine itself. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, the U.S. is just so hyper-focused on this proxy war with Ukraine, and I, that actually is a good segue to Russia because obviously China helped broker or at least like with a, played a role in brokering this current deal with Saudi Arabia and Iran, but it wasn't just China. It didn't happen overnight. You kind of mentioned in the beginning uh, the uh, participation of other re of other regional players. You have the Iraqis holding several negotiations. The Omanis uh, have been involved as well, um, though, of course, China oversaw the ultimate deal and then the foreign minister sealed it at a meeting in Beijing. 
So that's the, I mean, that's that, that shows the significance of Chinese power, but we also see a role, a diplomatic mediation, mediating role played by Russia as well. You had mentioned the Turkey and Syria uh, negotiations that Russia, and I believe Iran is playing a role as well that's in fine. overseeing those. So it also shows an Iranian role of of playing mediator and sort of, you know, lending its hand to some sort of stability uh, in the region. And then, of course, you also mentioned Syria and Saudi Arabia. You know, Saudi Arabia is in talks with Syria to reopen its embassy. Uh, and this is, I mean, this is a really big deal. This is after, I mean, of course, like a decade of Saudi Arabia participating in a regime change war on Syria where they armed and funded a collection of like fascistic uh, supremacist groups to try to overthrow the government alongside the U.S. and Turkey, which is why the Turkey-Syria detente would be so meaningful as well, that that's actually maybe even more important. But there's also discussions of reintegrating Syria into the Arab League. I believe there's like, maybe I think Qatar and Morocco are the two countries that are like holding out and standing against it till now. But the reason I raise that is because there's the, the Russians are playing a role uh, in mediating also the Syria uh, Saudi detente, uh, potential Syria Saudi detente. Um, so I guess, could you speak a little bit about the Russian role in the region? Because I think a lot of people in the West, their only real understanding of Russia in the Middle East is that they intervened in Syria. They typically have a negative view of that. Um, but more importantly, that you know, when they think of Russia, they just think of Ukraine. They don't think about what other, what other efforts Russia may be making in other parts of the world. Well, one thing I should add before I begin with, I respond to your question, is that the it's very interesting that Burns tells Mohammed bin Salman that the U.S. was blindsided, <laughs> and this shows this is reveals a lot about U.S. intelligence gathering, mm -hmm. because the talks it wasn't top secret. It wasn't something that was being advertised. I'm not in government. I don't play a role in government. But I knew that these talks were going to happen. And I guessed that they would probably succeed. Or that there was a high probability that it, they would succeed. And I wasn't in government. I don't go to any meetings or to any of these talks. You read the, you read the news. Uh, well, I, I know people or, okay. you know, or, or people, you know, they say this is happening or that's happening. But the point is that the U.S. with all its intent, intelligence gathering uh, mechanisms, if they were blindsided and they knew less about it than me. And I, I'm sure that some of your viewers will say, no, well, I'm he's very he, he's being humble or he or he doesn't want to expose his role. Anyone who knows me knows that I spend my time on campus. They can find me every day on campus. And that's where I am day and night. If I'm if I'm doing all these important things from my office, then I must really, really be extremely <laughs> good. Right. But there's no, I mean, anyone can just pop into my office and I'll be sitting there like, uh, you know, on every day. So I, I'm not involved and I don't, and I'm not informed about secret information and this is not this was not sort of top secret information I, I knew bits I heard bits and pieces from people that something you know in, that things were happening or may happen and it was you know it was to happen in China so if if they know less than me then I think that also shows the either the, the degree of decline mm -hmm. of the U.S. and that it is so incapable of figuring out because the U.S. may not have a lot of sources in Iran, or it may not have uh, good means to uh, in gather intelligence from Iran, but I'm sure the Americans have many sources in Saudi Arabia because all the princes study in the United States. So many Saudis go to the United States. There's so much interaction going on between the Saudi Arabia and the United States that if the Americans were blindsided, in my opinion, that shows that and that's another sign of uh, of of U.S. decline, mm -hmm. and uh, it it shows that what we see in Hollywood is uh, is uh, is basically just Hollywood. But Russia's involvement in the region, I would say, the defining moment was when General Soleimani convinced the Russians to enter Syria. 
because the Iranians, as you know, they they entered the fight in Syria in 2013, along with Hezbollah and Iran's allies, allies from Iraq and Afghanistan. The Iranians and, and the others were not involved until 2013 in, inside Syria. And uh, it only they only came in when tens of thousands of foreign fighters had come into the country and the Iranians felt that things were getting very dangerous and that ISIS and Al-Qaeda and these different groups, and you know the where ISIS comes from, and it was Al-Qaeda, so I don't want to go there, but all these different groups, Jaysh al-Islam, Ahlul al-Sham, all these different groups, they uh, were gaining, they, they had brought in tens of thousands of foreign fighters, uh, very vicious people, many of them, but very good and tough fighters, uh, so the Iranians felt that if these foreign these foreign fighters were tipping the balance of power, so the Iranians came in and they they gave martyrs and and so did Hezbollah and so did Iraqis and 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 Afghanis and the Iranians in they fell after a period of time when things were stable they they wanted to go on the offensive with of course the Syrian government but the Syrian government was under a lot of pressure. So the Iranians came in, the Iranians, the Syrians, the others, they felt that they had to go on the offensive. But if they wanted to win the war and they were determined to defeat these extremist groups, the casualties would be huge. Right. So the Iranians spoke to the Russians, the Russians were reluctant, uh, but gradually things changed. And when General Soleimani met President Putin and gave his proposals that where the Rus Russians would basically be, they would mostly be in the air, but also the Russians gave political cover, which they did in the past in the UN. The Russians then came in and that was very effective. And what, what is interesting, and, and this is just a small footnote, these pro-Western Iranians at the beginning of the war, they were basically mi mimicking the Western narrative, mm -hmm. how evil, uh, President Assad is, and you know how uh, we were helping a, a brutal dictator against the freedom fighters who were seeking democracy. That's what they were saying in Tehran. But interestingly, these same people, once the Russians came in, they said, "Why did you let let the Russians in? You know, this is, we we fought in Syria. You know, why should we allow the Russians to get credit or to get influence in Syria?" It's it, the, the way in which these people just flip uh, uh, and change their position overnight is, is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. But in any case, the Russians came in and they were a, a very effective uh, force in, in decreasing casualties among Syrians, among Iranians, among Afghanistanis uh, and Afghans, among Iraqis and Hezbollah. And uh, their, their air force was uh, was crucial and and they were also on the ground as well as in advisory roles and so on but uh, they they played a very positive role in an important role and crucial role alongside the rest of this coalition in defeating um ISIS and defeating al qaeda and uh, these other groups like Jaysh al Islam uh for example and i think that was a bit of a turning point uh, in the region because it showed the limits of American and Western power mm -hmm. where, and, and the Russians, the Iranians, the Syrian Arab army, the Syrian government. And I have to you know, stress here that the Syrian Arab army, they, uh, they were more important than anyone else in preserving the country. I mean, the Russians can help, the Iranians gave a lot of help and casualties, Hezbollah to Afghanistanis, Iraqis. But at the end of the day, it was the Syrian army right. that uh, they, they... They died the most, right? They, <laughs> they did suffered the most. The most casualties, no doubt right? about it. And they suffered the most. Yeah. And if it wasn't for them and this coalition, we would have black flags over Damascus. We would have black flags over Baghdad. Because remember, when ISIS attacked Iraq and reached Baghdad, and we're about to take... Uh, places like Arbil, they were also fighting against the Syrians. 
Right. And they're also fighting against other groups in Syria, which is, you know, Syria is complicated and you know it. So, you know, maybe not all your viewers know it, but but they a lot of their forces were in Syria. They couldn't use everything against, they had against Iraq. But imagine if they had won in Syria, then that fighting force, which invaded Iraq, would have taken back the right. things would have been catastrophic. So we would have had black flags over Syria and Iraq. And then eventually Lebanon, yeah. eventually, yeah. yeah. Lebanon and then, you know, Turkey. And mm -hmm. We would have had to fight these groups and ISIS inside our own country, inside our own borders. And Saudi Arabia and, and the rest. So when the, so this tipped the balance, I think. And for the first time, the West was on the losing, the, the two coalitions, the West, the Western coalition of NATO and ISIS and the regional allies and the Israelis. On the one hand, they failed against another coalition, the, the resistance axis, the resistance alliance, plus Russia. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that, I think, changed the, the region. I mean, it, we would have had a completely different region if, if Syria had fallen. And so the role of Russia was crucial. And history will remember that. Right now, Western media will say, well, they supported the brutal dictator. But even in the West, you see they know beginning to see the ordinary people are beginning to see the truth. And ironically, sad or sadly, it's well, ironically, we're hearing the truth. The only place where we're hearing some of the truth is from Fox News. <laughs> right because the, they have like an interest in in um well so it's interesting in the u.s for domestic yeah, I'm not, reasons I'm not yeah. condoning the supporting no no no, 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 no but it's true it's true it's true but it is of, amazing there's specific reasons behind that but you're not that's not incorrect there is a definitely a narrative that you will not hear at cnn the narrative you just said any any well, said. any of the reality I, I think it's really interesting though i'm not interesting i think the word is remarkable because what you just described where you had Syria, Hezbollah, Iran, ultimate, eventually Russia, um, and then China with its veto power, at least, uh, when it came to Syria on one side. And then on the other side, you had the U.S., right, all its NATO allies, uh, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, all of these countries on another side. And I mean, I think the fact that you have talks being mediated by the Russians between the Syrians and the Saudis to reintegrate Syria into the Arab League is really a testament to the failure of that entire operation um, that the most powerful country in the world could not overthrow the government of Syria. They did an incredible amount of damage and they still are obviously with sanctions, um, but they ultimately failed in the broader goal, right, of overthrowing this government. And then you also see like, you you know, with Syria and Turkey, this this other mediation, this this other negotiations being mediated by the Iranians and the Russians with the absence of the U.S., I think is also quite remarkable. And I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that, but then also Yemen. I mean, Yemen, you've had this war for eight years where the Saudis have been uh, executing this genocidal war that's left hundreds of thousands of dead, left millions on the brink of famine. Children literally starved to death in Yemen die from cholera. I mean, just horrific, horrific, horrific policies, completely armed by the United States and the UK. And now you have a potential peace deal on the horizon, uh, thanks to the Saudi-Iran rapprochement, rapprochement that was negotiated, you know, that was overseen by the Chinese. I mean, what's happening in the region, I think, is incredibly remarkable. And then on top of that, you know, I'm curious if you could maybe talk about the significance of all those potential peace deals. What does that mean for the region? And then moreover, what is the potential for a place, for example, like Lebanon, where a lot of the, you know, Saudi Arabia has intervened so much in Lebanon, I mean, continues to do so, all with the intention of trying to weaken Hezbollah in this broader war it has against Iran, right? Because it sees any axis of resistance participants as, as extensions of Iran. Could we potentially see positive consequences for a place like Lebanon or perhaps Iraq? It's too early to say because there are so many spoilers, potential yeah, spoilers. Right. The Americans will do whatever they can to impede 
uh, rapprochement, they'll do whatever they can to create new tensions or to revive old tensions. Uh, so I, I, I'm, I think none of us have any illusions about the potential for the Americans to cause trouble. Right. But if this process continues, then I think it's it's truly a win-win for everyone. Saudi Arabia uh, can use its hundreds of billions of dollars that it would have to, just as it spent before and what you know in wasted before in the war in Yemen, uh, that would come to an end, and it can spend hundreds of billions of dollars that it would be losing if it continued down this road on building its country. And uh, more importantly, I think even than that, more important than even that is the fact that if trade and business were to normalize between Iran and Saudi Arabia or Iran and other countries in the Persian Gulf region, then that would that that trade relationship itself would have enormous benefits uh, that are even greater. Mm -hmm. Right now we have the North South corridor or transit corridor that's being built between Iran and Russia and which links Eastern Europe and Russia to uh, the Persian Gulf. That would be huge for Saudi Arabia or for the Emirates or for Qatar. Uh, we also have the Belt and Road Initiative and the, the Chinese and Central Asian countries now that the route to Europe has been blocked from Russia, they want to, they also alongside China want to build that corridor that, that, that goes through Central Asia to Iran and into the Persian Gulf. So countries like, again, I mean, countries across, especially uh, East Africa and uh, the subcontinent would benefit enormously, but no country would benefit more than those countries in the Persian Gulf region from these two corridors and from trade and normalization with Iran. So uh, it is it would be a huge win for all these countries. It would be a huge win for Iran if this normalization process continues. And if uh, Turkey too, if that if there's no there's normalization between Turkey and Syria, that would add to to all of this. But I think it can only be good news for Lebanon because uh, Saudi Arabia, if its relationship with Iran improves and normalizes, if its relationship with Yemen improves and normalizes, that would mean, even though it's obvious that it would be very good for the people of Yemen, but it would be very good for Lebanon as well because a lot of Lebanon's problems were because of Saudi hostility towards the uh, the, the dominant coalition in the country, which includes Hezbollah and its partners uh, from different communities, Christian, Sunni, and Shia. Yeah, I think that's a, a really good point. And of course, when you talk about spoilers, I mean, one of the biggest spoiler, spoilers in the region remains the Israelis, uh, which are, are, of course, like completely outside of all of this detente that we're talking about. Um, and I mean, I think we saw that recently. I mean, Israel has its own internal struggles right now, obviously, like with Netanyahu and extreme anger inside the country against his judicial reforms by people who don't really care that Palestinians have no rights. But of course, once their own privileges are President. potentially under attack, right, then suddenly democracy is under attack. Uh, but there's a lot of domestic chaos taking place in Israel uh, that is interesting to watch play out. Uh, and of course, at the same time, I mean, just last week, we saw the Israelis literally bombing all of their neighbors, right? Bombing Palestinians in Gaza, shooting and killing Palestinians in the West Bank, bombing Syria repeatedly. I think it was something like seven times within the course of a week, um, as well as, of course, we saw the Israelis bomb Lebanon last week, though it was, I think, an interestingly symbolic gesture in the sense that they refrained from killing anyone which was intentional because they did not, it just shows that they're terrified of a war with Hezbollah. The fact that they are so um, cautious with the way they react whenever Lebanon's involved. And it speaks to the importance of, of having a deterrent capacity uh, in the region. But I'm curious your thoughts on, I guess, to shift here to, to the Israeli situation. Um, what, 
what do you what what do you have to say i guess about the current situation taking place inside israel there does seem to be uh i don't want to call it a war because that is definitely an exaggeration but an argument let's say uh between liberal and like fascist jews inside israel that's what's taking place there right now um and how that's playing out in the country and how that might affect the region and i know i'm packing a million questions into run but one but you can just go ahead and rant about your general thoughts about the israeli situation but also how the current peace deals taking place might affect the israelis and how the israelis might end up reacting particularly on america's behalf well if you enjoyed this episode and want to hear the rest, you can access it by becoming a Breakthrough News member at patreon.com slash breakthrough news.